Burned by Jeff Smith is often said to be the Lord of the Rings of comics, but can it live up to that reputation? Woof woof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with another video. Written and illustrated by Jeff Smith, the first issue of Burn was published by his own company Cartoon Books in July of 1991, with the 55th and final issue being released over a decade later in July of 2004. And Phone Bone is on the run from Boneville with his two cousins, Smiley and Phony. After the latter's scandalous campaign to become the mayor of Boneville goes horribly, horribly wrong. During their escape, they're separated by a sea of locusts and Phone finds himself in the idyllic village of Barrelhaven, where he meets and takes an immediate liking to a young girl called Thorn. However, what originally seemed like a haven to both Phone and Barrels becomes a town riddled with secrets, and Phone becomes embroiled in this ancient war between humans, rat creatures, locusts and dragons. But with the conflict constantly escalating, can Phone manage to find a way to bring peace back to the land? Okay, first part of the review, I do have to say get this book in color. I know it might seem a little bit hypocritical because when I reviewed Walking Dead last time I read that in black and white, but with this it feels like this is the way that it should be presented. That is probably because of the fact that the black and white edition was something that came out after the series was finished, so the colour was always supposed to be there and I think it's an integral part of this story. It's easy to distinguish characters, the tone is conveyed in the setting better and it also just has this Disney-like feel to it. Whilst we're on the art though, it's really charming throughout and I think it's just amazing that this was coming out over the span of about 13 or so years and it never really lost its style. There's no real drop in quality, it never looks like it does any kind of radical change. It stays consistent throughout which is just something really impressive for a book of this length and if you've looked at a few of the panels and it looks like something you might enjoy then don't worry that's what you get throughout it. Smith knew where every line needed to be, it's got this clean simplistic look to it that I don't think many people can do as well and as well every character that you knew by name whether they were human or not had something unique about them so that you could recognize recognize them as soon as he came back. And that was quite important because there were some characters that could disappear for a good couple of hundred pages, but as soon as they came back you knew exactly who they were. And even just reflecting on it now and thinking back, there's so many memorable people in this and you can immediately see the design in your head. I've heard that Netflix has got plans to make an animated series of this and I think that the style would translate really well and it's just beautiful to look at. Landscapes were another key piece of the art that worked really well for me. And as well, thinking back about my recent reviews, I think it must be that getting the background is the key component for me enjoying an art style. But with something that's in that fantasy genre, you need to make sure that you know the setting. You felt like the scenery was vast, even when you were introduced to Barrelhaven, when you saw them running away from Boneville. You just got that sense of scale and setting, and I think that the best thing that any kind of fantasy book can do is make you feel like you've never seen the full world. You should always feel like there's more that you could have discovered if it would have gone in a different direction, and you really get that with Bone through this art. As well, I touched on the panel in a little bit there and I think that this book did decide to get creative with it and I liked when it did that. Particularly when a character's having a dream, it would unfold in such a way that you always felt like you were never getting the full picture. I loved that detail and it allowed you to connect with the characters because when you wake up you never know exactly what you were dreaming about. Except for me because I have the same nightmare every time I go asleep. But I've always said that I think paneling is an integral part of comics that a lot of people will overlook so I did want to give it some attention in this review. And the last aspect of the art that I'll touch on because I feel like I could just go on about it forever, but humour was translated so well through this style. I love the comedic elements of this story and I think that the art was the thing that really brought it to the surface. It wasn't necessarily in the way that characters spoke but in the way that you saw them react. Especially characters like Phony, I like how animated he could get, he really reminded me of stuff like Donald Duck. And humour is one of the most difficult things to try and get across to an audience, which is probably the reason why I tried too hard at it. But there were moments throughout this book that genuinely made me laugh out loud because of the fact that a character's reaction would just exactly evoke the emotion that they were trying to display. It's often when a character looked dumbfounded or shocked, that's where I really felt like this book highlighted its strength. I spoke about the art distinguishing the characters, and honestly when I reflect on this book, they are the aspect of this title that I remember the most. I loved Phony Bone, I think he was probably my favourite character out of the entire book. There's just something about a character that's always thinking about themselves, always putting money before everything else that I really just enjoy following. There's just something about those characters that I really can't relate to and um, 
On a completely separate note, if you want to support the channel, check out our sponsor, Organic Price Books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services. And if you use code WOOF WOOF, you'll get $2 off your order. And kind of like I'm a love for myself will never die, you can use that code as many times as you like. But going back to the characters, there wasn't many that I disliked throughout it. I only really had a few major problems with some of the characters, and one of them was with phone. It was never detrimental to my reading experience, but I just wish that A, he had a different name, because honestly, it gets a bit confusing in this review if I'm talking about phone and phony. And it was kind of similar when you're actually reading the book, especially towards the beginning. Other characters literally had to refer to phony as the one with the star, just so that you knew which one was which. And B, I did wish he just had a little bit more about him. You know, Smiley's clearly got defining characteristics, phony's this greedy, selfish person, but phone was just the nice guy. Sure, yes, he still had emotional reactions to stuff, he still engaged with other characters, and he moved the plot forward, but he reminded me of the Harry Potter principle that other people have spoken about. That because he's the main character, he's supposed to be a bit of a blank slate so that anybody that's reading can relate to him in some way. Which is great, and I think it is important in these worlds that are so completely unfamiliar, but it just means that in a book full of memorable characters, Phone is probably the least of them. Thorn was probably my favourite character after Phony, and I really liked the arc that they took her through. At first it did appear that she was just going to be this love interest for Phone, and that, you know, she's just this traditional pretty girl. But then when we get into the cow race arc, you see that she's got a bit more about it, she can stand up for what she believes in, and she is a really tough fighter, and I liked seeing her come out of her shell a bit, and go on the journey that she went on. Don't worry, there's not going to be too many spoilers in this video, so I'm just trying to be as vague as I can. But Thorn handled certain situations in a way that just reminded me of Captain America. She was so headstrong all the time, she always did what she believed was right. She had great loyalty to her friends and the people around her and the villagers that she eventually had to protect. And I like that they didn't really deviate from that plan, especially with a book that went on for this many years. Grandma Ben was a great character too, and the one that I found myself going back and forth on my opinion about most. There were a lot of moments in this book where I didn't know if I could trust it. And I was a bit worried for the characters that were in her immediate vicinity. But at the same time, there was never a moment where I disliked it. That is such a fine balance to be able to walk across and I don't know how this book managed to do it but he did. At first she was just this sweet old lady that was somehow still at a physical prime, but some of my favourite parts of this book was seeing how her relationship with Thorn developed and also how she treated the other bones. In that war that everything was building up to, it was just interesting to see how she factored into that. However, the villagers of Barrelhaven was the aspect of this book that I think overstayed its welcome the most. I liked them at first, there were so many decent personalities in here and like I said earlier, everybody was distinguishable and seeing how they all kept falling for some of Phony's schemes and the way that they reacted when they found out were some of the bits of the book that I really liked. But when the book decided to go down a more structured and serious route and it looked like the story was really starting to kick in, they just kept appearing. And at that point, the villagers were actively slowing down the book. You'd often be taken away from the main storyline to see what they were doing and I never really particularly cared what was happening. Sure, yes, it did play into the main story a little bit, but at the same time, I preferred seeing what Thorn and Phone and pretty much everybody else other than the villagers were doing. And Lucius is an exception to this because I thought he was a really great character and I liked how he played into it because of the fact that he still had this relationship with Grandma Ben. And he was the one that mostly interacted with Phony, so of course I'm gonna like him more. But when the series decided to leave the village, I feel like they should have left the villagers there. Because I had this feeling that the cow race towards the beginning of the book was where those characters really peaked and it would have been good if we could have just left them on a high. The moments that they had after that were never more meaningful than they were at the beginning. The fantasy elements of this book were a lot of fun and it's clear that there was a massive amount of lore that goes into this title but admittedly some of the stories that characters were telling about the past and the heritage of this land just didn't interest me that much. The lineage of Thorn was something that I felt didn't need as much weight as it had towards the end of this book. Yeah, it was important to the story, it just didn't need as much backstory as they gave it. For me, I think there is this balancing act between giving enough information so that you've got the context, but at the same time not giving so much that you sort of remove them from the main story. I like a little bit of mystery, even in a fantasy. Like I said at the beginning, it's about knowing that there's more to this world than what you've already seen. And then it sort of brought in the question that if Thorn is this important, important character to this universe and this world, how come it just happened to be that the main character of this book bumped into it? But for me, I feel like if Phone would have met literally anybody else, there would have been no book. Although I will concede that's more of a me problem because I know that fantasy does have to rely heavily on its heritage and its lore. I just feel like there's different ways of going about it and this book gave me just a little bit too much. I wish we could have seen more of Dragon though. Maybe that's why I'm so harsh on the amount of backstory in the villages that went into this because of the fact that I just wanted to see other characters. Dragon, 
Ted, and even the two rat creatures that wanted to turn people into quiche were the people that I wanted to see more about. I just realised I said people when I meant like mystical creatures, so just allow it. But Dragon for some reason reminded me of Alan the Alien from Invincible. And speaking about the history and the fact that I felt it was too much, the parts of the Dragon history that we heard were the ones that I really liked. It gave me pretty much just enough so that I knew what I needed to know about Dragons, but it didn't give me so much that I felt like it needed to move on. But my biggest issue with this book is the overarching villain. Again, there's not going to be any spoilers, I'm going to be as vague as possible, but who they were up against at the end didn't really leave much of an impact on me. I thought the horde of rat creatures from the beginning was interesting and I wish that they could have made them a bit more formidable and maybe just had that as the main antagonist because I feel like the villain that we have by the end of the series is only really a threat because of the fact that we've been told that they are. They do a few little things here and there but I think that the rat creatures would have been a much more believable foe for Bone to go up against because he's such a tiny character and this is such a massive horde and we could have seen that the ways that they operated because it was clear that they had some kind of hierarchy and we knew some of them by name and it looked like we were finding some of the cracks in that ecosystem that could probably be exploited like a delicious delicious quiche and especially when Bartleby was introduced I felt like he was going to be a character that would be this divide between the two and it looked like they had a much bigger role in mind for him that they never really got to explore. Now I'm probably stating the obvious and saying that this is a long book. Everything that goes into this book is working towards the same one storyline. They're all little separate arcs but all of them just build on top of each other until we get to the end and I have to say despite its length this was a fun book to go on a journey with. It's a really quick read when you're invested in it, and I could easily sit down and read a couple hundred pages in one city. Not to brag. But the weird thing is that when I did put it down, I didn't feel that immediate need to go back to it. It didn't have that Moorish quality for me. I didn't feel like I was addicted to it in the same way when I read The Walking Dead, or when I went back and reviewed Why the Last Man. Now, those were can't put them down titles, but I think that something not being addictive shouldn't immediately be seen as a negative. I still had fun when I read it, and when I moved past that 300 page mark, I really started to understand why people love this series so much, and I think it was quite the reading experience to go on, so if you're watching this review to see if it might be a book that you would enjoy, I'd definitely recommend at least picking it up, and also if you are getting it for a younger reader, I think they will still be able to manage with it, because of the fact that even though it's got a lot of pages, there's never really a lot of dialogue, except for when there's like explanations, but it's not something like a Silver Age issue with Spider-Man, so I think you will still have a good time with it, and if you are in intimidated by the size of the book just don't be. The thing is, I'm conflicted when reviewing Bone because I did enjoy it and there's not many people that I wouldn't recommend this book to. But as I was reading it and I was getting through story arcs and I was turning the pages, I was just thinking to myself that this is just nice. There wasn't really something in this that made it a true great for me. And I know that I'm completely in the minority here and we almost have at least that one book or movie or TV show that everybody else says is one of the greatest of all time, but you just don't really see it. It's just missing that special something for me and I'm not even really too sure what it is that it would have needed to have done for me to put it in that great category. But to me this is the equivalent of going on a first date with somebody and it's really nice, you've had a great time, but then you get home and you realise that you don't want a second one. Actually, that's never happened. I'm not sure if Bone's just going to be one of those books that I need to do another reading of and it's just going to get better each time I go back to it, but at the same time, I don't really feel like it's one of those titles that I want to jump back into immediately. It's so bizarre. I've not had this feeling with a comic in a long time and I know that this is a beloved series and it did also make me want to read some of Jeff Smith's other works, but as I closed the book, I just feel like I didn't get out of it what other people did. I've heard other people's reactions to this. I know how acclaimed this title is. It even made it into the top 20 books that I know I must read and at the same time when I was drafting up my notes for this review there wasn't really too many negatives that I could bring towards it. So it could just be a similar case that with bone and the scope and the scale of it all it's just something that I don't really want to dive into again straight away because it is very rich in its heritage, its lore and also just the land that it takes you across. But at the same time I would wholeheartedly recommend this to other people so it kind of feels like I'm on two sides of a different fence. This is my final verdict. And Bone is truly one of a kind. It's an epic, well-crafted story for all ages that never really drops the ball or loses momentum across the 13 or so years it was originally being published. That's a monumental feat in and of itself, and I can't imagine how difficult it must have been reading this in single issues. And seeing Phone's journey from fleeing Boneville to taking refuge in Barrelhaven to eventually help fight in this ancient war is a great take on the classic hero's journey. Even up to the final pages, I feel like it's 
it's paying homage to that. And I know that some people feel like it does fall a bit flat towards the end. And yes, it probably could have done with a little bit more, but I still think if you follow those 12 steps of the hero's journey, Throne pretty much goes through all of them. And if there is one criticism of The Lord of the Rings, which people often compare this to, it's that that film never knows when to end. So at least Bone goes the other way in that direction. It's fun, always charming, and has a lot of heart, but I just felt like it was missing that extra special something for me to truly put this amongst the greats. If I was to do a tier list of recent reads, like I kind of did with the Spider-Man villains that I want to fight, this would definitely be an A-class book, but I wouldn't feel comfortable putting it in the S tier. But still, this is a book that has stood the test of time, and I know a lot of people absolutely adore this, and there's not really many negatives that I've got for it. And this book has also been integral to helping many young readers get into comics, and it's also been a welcomed break for a lot of seasoned comic fans that just want a break from traditional superheroes. I'd definitely recommend it, and I think that the parallels between The Lord of the Rings and this aren't completely unfounded, but for me, it was just missing that little pinch extra to give it that X factor that I also can't really put my finger on. But for the experience I got and the enjoyment that this title brought to me, I do have to give this a very respectable score of 75%. Woof woof! So that's the video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, why did you get this far? If you've read Bone, let me know what you think about it in the comment section below, along with what you think that extra special thing is that I just missed. Do me a massive favour, share this video where you can, because the next review is probably going to be always an invader. But I guess that's the video, and until next time, just make sure that you stay safe, and stay mad all you dogs. Woof woof! See you at the next video.